Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. There are some of the paramilitary groups in California that believe you're supposed to have a jacket and a tie on when you speak. <laughs> to show that you've made progress. <laughs> and I have come to believe that anyone who would have a jacket and a tie on to speak to a, a group like this on a hot night has not made any progress at all. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Don an alcoholic. <laughs> nice looking crew, actually. A lot of young people here. You know, I've been speaking in Alcoholics Anonymous, drunk and sober for 34 years, and <laughs> and it, it, it becomes disconcerting to see as many young people as there are. I, I was a meeting just a little while back, and, and I mentioned to the person I was with, I've never seen a meeting so filled with young people. And they replied quite accurately, that isn't the problem, you've just never been this old before. <laughs> See, that's one of the problems with staying sober is that you tend to age. Whereas if you drink, uh, probably that won't happen to you. <laughs> but it does have certain disadvantages. I was identified as the speaker there and one of the young women at the next table back there, I, I heard her say, what's that old goat possibly going to say to help us? You know, a fast bicycle ride in a love affair would kill him. Uh, and that's not really true. I go pretty good on a bicycle. Uh, <laughs> I have a... A gay guy I know in Hollywood was telling me the other day about how he said he had always been attracted to older men until one day he looked around and found there weren't any anymore. You know, and I didn't quite identify with that, but I, I did identify with the basic problem because I remember not too long back speaking out at some place called The Nest in the San Fernando Valley. To those of you who don't know it, if that's... That's the sort of a place where if you still want to associate with lower companions and stay sober, you can go to that club. <laughs> and I happened to be, I was speaking out there and got onto a spiritual flight and soared about the room. And <laughs> when I settled, they, they came forward to touch the hem of my garment for individual healing. <laughs> except for one young maiden who hung back. And I could tell, it seemed, that she was in need of personal healing. <laughs> Perhaps even the laying on of hands. <laughs> and uh, it was true, after the multitudes had dissembled, she came forward, her eyes warm with admiration, adoration, what I took to be naked lust. And she spake unto me, saying, that was so beautiful, and you remind me so much of my grandfather. <laughs> How sharper than a serpent's tooth is the sting of an ungrateful child, I'll tell you. <laughs> I had dinner there with Tom, and he was talking about you had some speaker from California out here a while back who was laying down the law according to whatever group it was that he belongs to who we have groups out there that are kind of a and beyond you know beyond almost anything and, and you have to be tolerant of these things the you see AA has been around now for 
over half a century. And as a result of it, we have built up all sorts of nonsensical, liturgical expressions and rules that don't make any sense, but they're part of our program now. I mean, if you think we have silly things we say, you should go to the Catholic Church, see some of the things they say. You know, say. <laughs> But any spiritual movement develops a certain amount of foolishness after a period of time, and we have ours. You know, speakers get up and say, it's good to see people coming into AA who still have some semblance of order in their lives. When AA started, it was nothing but derelicts and bums. If you had a wristwatch, you couldn't come to a meeting. Well, that's silly. I mean, AA was started by a stockbroker who carried the message to a practicing doctor, and the two of them made their first 12-step call on a lawyer. <laughs> and, ex you know, and except for that third guy, it really wasn't a bad trio. <laughs> never been made up of derelicts, by and large. Or they'll say, it's good to see you young people coming in. When I came to AA, if you were more than two years younger than a tree, you weren't eligible <laughs> for membership. <laughs> Which, again, is silly. I mean, Bill was in his 30s when he wrote the book. The oldest members in L.A., Cliff, Sybil, the rest of them, have been sober 40 years more. They were in their late 20s. I was in my 20s. It's hard to believe now, but... You know, it's a, in fact, if you start drinking and cross over the invisible line, as most of us do in our teens, hell, you're not going to live long enough to be ineligible for a young people's meeting. <laughs> Particularly with all the better living through chemistry that's available today. <laughs> but if these things don't do any harm. They're just things we say. It's like you probably heard it said, uh, do not become emotionally involved in the first year. Now, whether that's a valid observation and a bit of advice, no one knows, because in the history of AA, no newcomer's ever taken it. <laughs> okay, but if you have any feeling at all for tradition, you'll tell your babies that, so when they screw up, as they invariably shall, you can add to their torment by saying, I told you not to go out with that loser. <laughs> But these things don't do any harm. It, 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 again, if people want to be, I was speaking in a meeting with, there were a lot of young people's and, uh, people there, and I, I actually heard somebody say, I spilled more than you drank. And I thought, good. I, in fact, I used it in my talk. I said, the only person who could say that with any degree of accuracy is the captain of that Exxon tanker up in Alaska. <laughs> You know, if he ever makes a program, he's going to be on the circuit almost immediately. <laughs> if you have anything going for you that causes you to be distinguishable in a crowd or as a result of something you have done, you're going to be asked to speak. You know, if your collar's turned the wrong way or if you've got several degrees behind your name, you're, you know, you're, or a motion picture person. God, I remember when I was doing the public relations work there in Los Angeles some 20, 30 years ago, however long it was, I used to get calls from people that say, we're having the 8th Kentucky Annual Convention. Do you have any motion picture stars that could come out and be our banquet speaker? Now, they didn't ask if the person was sober or had a message of any kind. They just wanted a motion picture star. And I used to tell them, well, I don't know. I'll check the sanitariums to see who might be out in time. <laughs> Hell, I once spoke at a meeting where the guy was, had just been released from San Quentin. He'd killed two people, you know, and through pardoning of the death penalty and so on. He, he was out free, and they put him up on the podium. Yeah, great story. <laughs> now you're reading my mail, Jim. Uh, but no, that's true. And so if that guy from the Exxon Tanker, you can imagine how quickly he'd be on the podium. And he'd probably give a good talk, too, you know. He, I used to run a tight ship. <laughs> Old Exxon cocktail, 10 million gallons on the rocks. <laughs> and then I ruined all of Alaska. Oh, go, Fred, go, go. Uh, you see, we have a rare form of 
public speaking here. Uh, you, you know, you can get up and begin an address by saying, I've been crazy all week, and everybody, oh, <laughs> tell it like it is. You're reading my mail. Uh, you can't start an address with that line in very few places and, get, you know, and get a response like that. Uh, I don't know. I, Tom was also worried, apparently, because he was running into people who were giving analytical explanations of what they were doing in their sobriety. You know, they were on some kind of a probe, or they were doing this or that or whatever it was. And I was trying to assure him that this is a natural phenomenon when you're new. You know, we seem to find it impossible to simply accept anything unless we have somehow wrapped an emotional superstructure around it. You know, we did that. I, I took A and summarized it into a little intellectual pill that I could give to a newcomer and telling him to swallow it and lay back and pass a miracle. And, uh, and they won't do it. And then even worse, you'll see people staying sober the wrong way. You know, and when you're new, that's extraordinarily disconcerting. I'd rather see him in a drunkard's grave than sober like that. <laughs> you know, uh, because the fact that they deviate from your program becomes a threat to you when you're relatively new. But after you've been sober quite a while, AA becomes simpler and simpler. I wish you really... It's a shame. I know this taping goes on here. No place I haven't been able to find a virgin audience in years now, but uh, if you could get some of the tapes I gave before my last slip... <laughs> God, they were inspirational. <laughs> I mean, they had probing, deep insights. I discussed the history of AA, its indebtedness to the Oxford movement, William James. I touched upon their Jungian Freudian overtones. I, there, there was really something there for everybody. It, it was a damn shame I couldn't stop drinking. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now IAA seems to me without question the simplest disorder ever to have afflicted mankind, most easily recognizable, identifiable, and treatable. You know, the very name alcoholism gives you such a marked clue as to what the problem is. <laughs> <laughs> if you weren't handicapped with a degree in psychology and someone were to say to you, what do you think causes alcoholism? I warrant you'd come up with the correct response instantaneously. Alcohol? <laughs> right. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, but that's true. No alcohol, no alcoholism. We don't. Have, there's no emotional graph of the alcoholic. We don't experience any emotions non-alcoholics don't experience. If alcohol had never been invented, there wouldn't be anybody that you'd call an alcoholic. Because we come under every hue and emotional spectrum. The book says that we come, we come, some are total psychotics, psychopathic inferiors, sociopaths, neurotics in every hue on the emotional spectrum. And then those people who are well-adjusted, normal, happy people, <laughs> beloved in every respect except the effect alcohol has on them. I've never met any of those people. <laughs> But sobering up in Los Angeles, you wouldn't be apt to. <laughs> Chances are they were around Akron or Cleveland someplace when they were writing the book, or maybe Newark, uh, whoever it was. But, no, it, but we don't have any different emotions than other people. One person, ten, who drinks, going to become an alcoholic. No reason a psychotic should get off any easier than the rest of us. But you don't have to be crazy to make this program. No hindrance if you are, but... Not mandatory. You know, we haven't, we have just barely ten people walk on the face of the moon. One of them's already in AA. <laughs> they don't fire those guys off unless they check them out and they're wired pretty well. I don't know if you ever heard him pitch, but he talks about, you know, how he stepped off on the moon, looked back at the blue and white globe we call the Earth, and said, I'm 83,000 miles from the next drink. <laughs> I got a thing about it because I, I read something the other day, very profound. I only use these for reading or in case of a fight. Uh, 
It's amazing how profound things are if you agree with them. <laughs> this one says, there is no reason to charge the slip to an alcoholic behavior or a second heart attack to cardiac behavior. The alcoholic slip is not a symptom of a psychotic condition. There's nothing screwy about it at all. The patient simply didn't follow instructions. He goes on to say, in any event, the psychology of the alcoholic is not as different as some people try to make it. Disease has certain physical differences, yes. And the alcoholic has problems peculiar to him, perhaps in that he has been put on the defensive and consequently has developed frustrations. But in many instances, there's no more reason to be talking about the alcoholic mind than there is to describe something called the cardiac mind or the tuberculosis mind. I think we'll help the alcoholic more if we can first recognize that he is primarily a human being, afflicted with human nature. Now, that was written in 1947 by Silkworth. The doctor is quoted in a book, and one was sobered up Bill Wilson, so it isn't anything very modern. But today we seem to have gone so far beyond that that speakers get up and they, under the guise of telling what they used to be like, they describe their own hang-ups and then say, that's alcoholism, or even worse, that's the ism. Well, that's a quaintness that will make you vomit up your sleeve if you think about it. And what they're describing usually is either, as the doctor says, the human condition, meaning it's common to everybody, or it's something very peculiar to them. Not alcoholism. You know, people get up and they'll say, oh, there are times, you know, when I, I just don't feel I can cut it out there in the world. I don't know if I'm adequate. I wake up in the middle of the night having doubts. and That's the ism at work. The hell it is. That's how much human nature at work. You think the non-alcoholic goes around bubbling with confidence? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, down where I work where the tigers are. <laughs> you know, I'm sure that you, know, you stick your head up out of the underbrush, some gorilla <laughs> shoves you back down again. You know, I'm sure the Caesars and the Pharaohs had doubts, you know. Woke up in the middle of the night thinking, what am I doing with this stupid laurel wreath? You know, I'm no Caesar, just an Italian kid trying to get by, and they pump the... <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they, they, they say the dumbest thing. I had a guy the other day, you know, he said, well, I was an alcoholic long before I took the first drink. Why, by the time I was ten, I was already immature. <laughs> Because I don't, you know, or people say, we're not bad people trying to be good, we're sick people trying to be well. Well, maybe they are, but I'm not. I, I was an immature person who's trying to grow up, <laughs> that's all. I began drinking when I was 15, and alcoholic is, alcohol is a great preservative. Adolescence is a form of insanity, and alcohol will preserve anything you put in it. <laughs> it's true. So drop a specimen, a bottle of alcohol, come back a decade or two later, still there, unblemished and unchanged. Put alcohol into an adolescent, come by 10, 20 years later, still there. <laughs> well, I don't mean he hasn't aged. I mean, your hair grays, your face wrinkles, you may be educated beyond your intelligence, but, it, but emotionally, you're still going to be that adolescent. Oh, my God. <laughs> Look at me. See me. <laughs> yeah. Nothing mysterious about it. The ones who, of course, have come on with their specific problems, they're even worse. I had a guy, remember, I came around on the Early meetings where the guy used to look out over the audience and say, if you want this program, you're going to have to admit you're a thief, because all alcoholics are thieves. That disturbed me, because I, I didn't steal tangible things. Maybe I wasn't in need, or maybe I was too frightened, I don't know, but I didn't steal tangible things. I only stole things that were worthwhile. Your time, your affection, your love, your appreciation, your consent. I think I wasn't going to give back to you. But, I mean, I didn't steal things that were physical. And then I got thinking about that. I thought, this guy doesn't know all alcoholics. Even if he's social and has a wide acquaintanceship, he probably doesn't know more than a few hundred. So what he says about all alcoholics tells you nothing about all alcoholics. But you've learned something very important about him. He's a thief. <laughs> <laughs> so we stayed sober together for a long time, you know, and I've watched him burn a lot of newcomers, uh, you know. But uh, 
Oh, another guy was even more disconcerted. He used to actually point his finger out at the audience and say, if you want to make this program, the first thing you're going to have to do is admit you're a latent homosexual. Boy, this shook me. <laughs> See, he was telling me I had to give up boys. You know, and I hadn't even tried them. <laughs> as far as I knew, they might be the answer, because my wife was sure as hell not acting very appropriately. I'll tell you that. <laughs> And then I realized he didn't know all alcoholics, but I'd learned something about him. <laughs> yeah, I'd never known him in the biblical sense, but we've been acquainted for decades. But uh, no, you, you will have enough hang-ups to work on your own. You don't have to adopt anybody else's. You're going to have to grow up. That's really about all you're going to have to do. Very painful. The only thing harder than growing up is not growing up. And it, of course, it affects your daily life to some extent. I, I just, uh, my wife and I, my wife and I just got back from a, a trip to Hawaii here, and uh, the first day there, we went out kayaking. I'd never done that before, and I wanted to try it. You know, and it, it takes kind of an odd pull on your muscles of your back, and they're supposed to put a little board behind you in those rubber kayaks, and they didn't for me. And uh, moderation is a rumor to me, and I. Uh, <laughs> So I went up three different rivers the first day, and, and the next day we went scuba diving out on flippers, and uh, was out there for quite a few hours, which is an odd movement on your spine, and the next day I really felt it in my back, it was terrible, so I settled for a 12-mile hike up Waimea Canyon, and the following day I couldn't move. And uh, I knew what the problem was, obviously, and so I couldn't see a doctor there. No doctors available, so I went to an emergency hospital, and I said, I have a problem with my back. I'm reasonably sure nothing but inflamed muscles that I haven't, I've overused, and I'd like to get an anti-inflammatory of some kind if I could, but if you want to take a check and reassure me that it isn't any kind of a disc problem, be appreciated. They took about uh, $400 worth of x-rays, and then they said, you have inflammation in the small of your back. And... Uh, I said, yeah, about what I suspected. And he said, well, we'll give you something for it. He said, no one ever leaves the doctor's office empty-handed. There are a few licensed pushers we have. And <laughs> it's true. You know, in Hollywood, they could, on the death certificates, they really should write cause of death prescribed. <laughs> you, know, uh, <laughs> you know, we worked with them. Marilyn Monroe's and the Judy Garland's and the rest of them get them sober for a while, and then some doctor or psychiatrist would say, those people in AA, they're fanatics. Don't pay any attention to them. Take some of these harmless little tablets. To, and uh, But anyhow, that's so why I said to the doctor, what are you going to give me? And she said, well, no, nothing. Just some anti-inflammatories, and then I'll give you some muscle relaxant and, and something for the pain. I said, what are you giving me for the pain? She said, oh, just a simple morphine drip solution. And I said, well, my wife is with me, and I'll need quite a bit if we're going to have a party. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, well, she didn't quite understand, so I explained that I was a member of AA and that uh, I, I didn't take anything like that. And she said, well, and I said, what's in the muscle relaxant? She said, well, that couldn't possibly harm you. That's Librium. <laughs> And I said, well, there are some doctors who think alcoholism is caused by a Librium deficiency. <laughs> and uh, I can't take that because I've been a member of AA now uh, for several decades, and I'm hoping they're going to start a pension plan, and I want to get my, <laughs> uh, I want to keep my entitlements. <laughs> no, AA it, it does affect you. Yeah, but I'm not, by the way, against medication. If you're in a hospital or uh, or someplace where your, your dosage is being controlled, uh, I'm all in favor of it, but not out on the street, at least not me. <laughs> Christ, I, I should, probably shouldn't talk about them being taped, isn't it? Uh, oh, uh, some years back, I decided I'd had enough children. Uh, had a whole bunch of them. I was just fun, and I don't know how it happened, but... Uh, <laughs> I decided I'd had enough, so I went to a doctor for a... My wife and I, she drove me down to the doctor for a little <coughs> snip job, and uh, <laughs> they give you medication. And it, But hell, you, you have to give an awful lot of medication to knock out an alcoholic. 
I mean, they gave me sodium pentothal. I guess it was supposed to put me out. I don't know, but all it did was make me high. I remember lying there on the table and saying to the nurse, as long as you're down there, honey, how'd you like to make a lifelong friend? <laughs> I rode home yelling out to my wife driving, and I'm yelling out the window of the car, I'm safe, ladies! Uh, but they, too, wanted to give me various uh, things for pain, and... <laughs> I told him, no, you know, I'll just walk bow-legged for a few days. I mean, it's not that, it's not that big a deal. See, because I, as I, I indicated, I don't understand this foolishness. I am not a non-alcoholic, someone who hates to have his faculties impaired. Hey, non-alcoholics have no trouble with alcohol because it doesn't do to them what it does to us. It's funny, sometimes... You know, Sometimes the non-alcoholic will say of us, you alcoholics, you're lacking in discipline, willpower. You know why they say that? They think we want to stay sober. <laughs> if they had any idea what our true goal was, they would stand in awe <laughs> at our dedication, perseverance, <clears throat> and steadfastness. What the hell do they have they will pursue to the gates of insanity or death, huh? <laughs> Nothing. Candy asses, all of them. <laughs> I'm probably there are some al here, and I, I don't mean to make fun of you by statements like that. Uh, you're not at fault. You seem to have been born now. <laughs> well, when we want to do something other than stay drunk, and then we stay sober. You know, alcoholics have tremendous willpower. We often express it in the form of won't power, but by God, it's the same thing. If I thought that willpower, discipline, or grit had anything to do with social drinking and the ability to, for me to drink social, I'd probably still be fighting it, because I'm very disciplined. Hell, I got through law school top of my class. remember being fed intravenously that I'd been on a terrible binge just before the bar. Still passed it so high, I got a secret letter from the president of the bar association telling me I won the top five in the state. Hey, we have discipline if we want it. I had to quit smoking some years back. I smoked two to three packs of camels a day for 35 years, despite the fact I come from the backwoods of Oregon where we used to smoke the jerky out in the backyard, you know, we'd shoot the deer and hang the strips uh, outside. But for 35 years, I made lung jerky. <laughs> uh, but I, so I had to quit. Doctor gave me a mantra to repeat, emphysema, and uh, I don't believe in rushing into things. And, you know, no problem. When you're ready to quit, you quit. Get on your knees, bark like a dog for a week. Nothing <laughs> very significant about it. <laughs> I got, a, I got a wall full of trophies. I won racing motorcycles out. In the, I got through the male menopause racing motorcycles with Steve McQueen. You know, after I was 45, 50 years old, I got trophies of one who was 50 years old. I don't mean the flat-out speed racing that the punks go in for. I, I'm talking about that enduro, the long, where they throw you into a creek, creek bed and make you go 150 miles to see how much pain you can stand. And alcoholics are just naturally gifted at that. <laughs> I could, I could hardly go half a block when I quit uh, at a fast shuffle, and they told me to get into running to help rehabilitate whatever was left of my lungs and my body. And I, you know, they say I could hardly go half a block, and I celebrated my 60th birthday not several years ago, uh, <laughs> running the Los Angeles Marathon, 26 miles. And, and the odd thing is that despite the damage I did to my lungs in every race I've been in, 10Ks, half marathons, marathons, I, I won. I don't mean I came in first. I have no idea what the fanatics up in the front are doing. <laughs> but back in the rear where the spiritual ones gather. <laughs> uh, see, there we have categories. They break you down by age, by sex, by occupation even. And I have continued to refine my category till I'm the only one who's in it. 
So when I finish, I win. <laughs> Which, by the way, isn't as idiotic as it may sound, because that's what life is like. We're not competing with anybody else. We're the only ones in our category. You're not competing. I'm not competing with you. You're competing with yourself. You play the game, you bear the pain. You finish, you're a winner. Quit, go out and get drunk, you're a loser. Simple. But uh, I don't know. I, as I say, I don't see anything odd about alcoholism. It's so simple. I don't know anything about the transcendental medication the kids have today. There's no such thing as a pure alcoholic. I'm sure under age 30, probably under age 40, maybe even 50. I don't know. But half the stuff that's available today wasn't even invented when I quit. And uh, what, what it was wasn't offered my milieu anyhow. And so I see the young people coming in, and I'm delighted because if A didn't work for them, it'd die. And they have to go through a period of redundancy, you know, where they get up and say, I'm an alcoholic addict. You know, that's like saying, I live in Phoenix and in Arizona. <laughs> <laughs> You know, of course, if you're an alcoholic, you're an addict. What the hell do you think alcohol is? There may be addicts who aren't alcoholics. I don't know. But every alcoholic, by definition, an addict. And half the old-timers who aren't mad about it are sitting there smoking cigarettes as if nicotine was a vitamin. You know? I don't, I don't like to hear about that addict. Uh, So they have to go through that nonsense for a while. Doesn't do any harm. Nothing does any harm, really. Hell, I was speaking at an odd little meeting in Hollywood. A lot of odd little meetings in Hollywood, but uh, <laughs> this one was called uh, "Anything Goes" or what have you, or "Up Yours" or something. And uh, they not only went through the redundant alcoholic addict, they got into the naming their chemical of preference. You had to be a pharmacologist to follow some of them. And, if you can't be the worst in AA, I mean the best in AA, you're going to have to be the worst. And so it began to be kind of a bragging contest. And finally, a very affluent young woman got up. You could tell she had money because she was dressed like a slut. And, <laughs> you know, you wouldn't go out in the street looking like that uh, unless you were well-heeled. Uh, and she said in a haughty voice, I'm only into freebase cocaine. You know, and my heart just rushed out to her. I thought, the poor dear, she'll never know the joy of a week's run on Muscatel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, such specialization, like a koala bear. They run out of eucalyptus, they're screwed, you know. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't know anything about it because it wasn't around, but if it had been around, I'd have taken it. I can't imagine an alcoholic in full power and someone coming up to them and saying, here, hit, toke, pop, snort, some of this, you get there quicker, but no, thank you, I'm killing myself with this. <laughs> but alcoholism is so simple and the cure is so simple. Occasionally you'll see a hand raised at a question and answer meeting by some shaky newcomer who says, how do you really stop drinking? You know, as if there was some magic to it. You know, as if some uh, evangelist like Oral, you know, or his brother Anal was going to lay on. Heal, heal. Out thou demon rum. You know, or as if some fairy was going to touch you with a magic wand. Which happened to me in Hollywood one night, actually. Uh, I mean, it wasn't harmful, it was kind of pleasant, but it, it, didn't, it didn't help with my drinking. Uh, no, but, I mean, if you can control the movement of your elbow, eternal sobriety is yours to command. I mean, there may be some who come around who's so far gone, their arms spastic like reaches out and hurls things toward their face. <laughs> but if you can fend it off... <laughs> you stay sober it is astonishing how long you can stay sober if you don't drink <laughs> now of course you're not going to want to do that unless you move over into the second part of our program which is 
The obsession. Nothing to do with mental illness. The obsession. That somehow, someday, we're going to beat this thing. We have a physical allergy that's permanent. It's like any other allergy. You can't tell whether we're allergic any more than you can tell if anybody else is allergic to something until you put it in their body. You can't tell if a person's allergic to tomatoes unless you give them some or give them a scratch and then they break out in a rash, break out in spots. Same way with me when I was drinking. Couldn't tell an alcoholic until you gave me some and then I broke out in spots. You know, San Francisco, Tijuana, <laughs> Las Vegas. <laughs> but the thing is, we're not going to want to quit drinking until we do something about that obsession, until we get in that state of sweet reasonable, it's known only to the dying, that seems to be a prerequisite to the idea you might be wrong. Because we're not going to change overnight. Most of us wouldn't cross the street if we thought it'd make us feel better. You know, we're just like the non-alcoholic. I can stand here and hurt just as long as you can. Some bitch is going to do it my way. God damn it, I'm going to hurt her. <laughs> I never met a newcomer who was looking for happiness or contentment, looking for cause for complaint justification, explanation for failure, by God. But it, our program is nothing unique about it. It's a distillation of every discipline that I've ever read about. I've never read a religion, a philosophical discourse, advice from the elders of the village, that didn't all recommend exactly the same thing for your daily life. Forget the dogma, the superstructure, that we seem to find it necessary to coat our religions and therapeutic discourses with, but just look at what they talk about as a way to live. Honesty, it's a hallmark of ours. Honesty is not unique to AA. Truth will set you free is a message goes back quite a ways. Down in Chino Prison in uh, L.A. County, there, there's a, over, a scroll work over one of the entrances that says, The truth shall set ye free. Whenever I've spoken there, I've mentioned that doesn't mean instantly, it means ultimately. <laughs> you know, uh, the idea that you take inventory, that you make confession, couldn't come as a shock, I wouldn't think, to the Catholic Church. There's nothing new about AA, it, it's simply that we have to do it. The non-alcoholic doesn't. Nothing ever happens to the non-alcoholic when he clings to those dubious luxuries, or as our book characterizes them, of resentment and self-pity and getting even and paying back, looking out for number one. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like that. All they do is get locked jaw ulcers, ruin their lives. But nothing serious occurs. <laughs> no one has ever been arrested for driving while pissed off. <laughs> You don't get picked up for being a mope, whining and disorderly. <laughs> Common mope, you want. They, so we have to do something about it. We're forced to live a happy life. <laughs> but I don't... It can be endured, newcomer. You can get used to joy, even. Even contentment can be endured. And I don't want to take away all your hope. You're also going to know moments of pain exquisite beyond your imagination on this program. Because things are going to happen to you, as they do to all human beings. The universe doesn't rise up on its tippy toe when you quit sucking on a jug. <clears throat> You're going to be rejected, abandoned, unappreciated, not having enough of anything. And we're reasonable. All we want is more than there is. <laughs> People you love are going to die. You're going to become injured. All the things that flesh your heir to are going to happen to you sober. Why shouldn't they? No two-legged beast ever got out of the forest without those things. Why should we be spared? In fact, you know, talking about uh, giving funny stories, and we laugh at the horrible things we did, and they are funny now because they're in retrospect. We're not doing them anymore, and they're in a the distance. But sometimes when we talk, we forget that during those years of our drinking, it was hell for everybody around us. We did brutal things. A while back, before we were going to go to Hawaii, several months ago, in fact, that's how I got my dates fouled up for coming over here, but uh, my <coughs> wife came home from her employment and walked into the house thinking she was going to pack for a vacation. Instead, she interrupted a burger, or smashed her in the face, crushed all the bones in her face, and put her in a hospital. Now, she'd been sober 22 years carrying the message. You might say, why should she be brutalized like that? Why not? In fact, maybe we're in a better position to understand it and accept it than the non-alcoholic who has no program. <coughs> they thought at first the guy was doing it because maybe he was one of my... The guy was mad at me. 
I'm a judge, and sometimes people don't have a sense of humor. <laughs> but it wasn't. He, he was just some guy loaded on crack and wanted money for his next fix. And he may make this program someday. I hope he does. But when he talks about the funny story about how I went into this house, <laughs> it wasn't just a judge. It was a justice of the appellate courts, and his wife came on and bang, I hit her in her mouth. I won't laugh too hard, I don't think, and I hope he doesn't ask me to sponsor him. <laughs> you know, I, uh, So life is going to have its tragedies, <clears throat> but most of it is going to be very good. You know, I, I, speaking of tragedies, the thing is, you, you will find things occurring on this program where it seems like you're in a, a little cylinder of pain, exquisite beyond belief, and there's not only no door, there isn't a seam, and you just stand there and hurt because you forfeited your right to chemical peace of mind. And then one day, the walls fall away, and you're in a world you couldn't have dreamt of. And you're not embarrassed or ashamed or guilty anymore when good things happen to you, because you've earned them. By God, you've earned them. It doesn't take much of a person to make this program. It's going to take all of them. And, yeah, I, you know, I, I remember things happening. God, I guess it's been 15 years ago now. I thought I had my life all in order, married to a lovely lady, and uh, had a son who was just... Entering junior high school, the perils of puberty with testosterone rush was on, and uh, and then suddenly I found myself alone with the boys because other people have their own destinies. They're not appendages to my story. They don't just fill up space in my life. They have their own careers and things they have to do. And so I was alone with this kid, and I thought no good can come of this but break my heart in two. And, uh, yeah, we endured. I'd like to tell you, as a result of my wonderful program, I was able to talk to this boy one-to-one. -one. But any man who says he talks to his pubescent son one-to-one -one lies about other things, too. <laughs> you know, of course you don't talk to an adolescent one-to-one. -one. They have no speech. You know, they're going through the agonies of the damned. It's the worst period in your life. And yet they're utterly mute, virtually. I mean, my boys, they built like Greek gods. They get a pimple. Ah, their life is ruined, you know. The girls were even worse. They'd come home in tears, and I'd say, what happened? That boy. What boy? What did he do? He looked at me. What do you mean he looked at you? How did he look at you? Funny. What do you mean funny? Funny, aggressive, funny, hostile, funny, lewd, fun, kind of funny. Funny, funny. <laughs> <You know. laughs> they have no mosaic against which to set their life's experiences, and they have no command of the English language. <laughs> they go into their room. They have primordial grunts that they amplify and call it music. <laughs> Of course I didn't communicate with him. The only time I used to see him, I'd throw money in the hall. And when he came out, ha! Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we endured, and he's 24 or 5 or so now. He graduated from college. He's on his own, doing okay. And after a couple of years of batching or so, a young lady that I mentioned here earlier... Uh, came into my life and moved into our home where angels might have feared to tread. And we've been married about 10 years now. I don't, I mean, she's got 22 years of sobriety. As I mentioned, I don't monkey with newcomers, but uh, she came on the program so young. Absolutely. She seemed like a child to me. I don't mean immature child. Hell, she went back to law school recently and completed it and passed the California bar just so she could criticize my decisions. <laughs> And, but to me, she's youthful, beautiful, and uh, yet she seems to like me. And that's very good. She doesn't object to old age creeping on her at night, and that's better. <laughs> and my work, too, you know, it, it seemed to go all to hell or in and about that same period. And, and work is very important to most of us, and certainly those who grew up in the 30s. And God, I can remember my worst experiences were when I was new on the program uh, many, many years ago, and I was trying to find work after I got squared away a little bit and went to, going into large law firms and wanting them to 
understand and appreciate, and so I would tell them some lighthearted, funny stories about my drinking, things that were a source of innocent merriment at an AA meeting, and I found a non-alcoholic doesn't understand the wit. And, and, <laughs> I might, you know, I don't mean bottle stories. There's some simple, like maybe the time I got drunk and threw my mother-in-law down the steps, and uh, being intoxicated, fell after her, got a hernia, you know, or something. And uh, this guy didn't laugh. He didn't titter a tig, titter a tit, giggle a gig. He, he, he just kind of stared at me in disbelief. And I thought, I guess I'm being too subtle for him. Uh, so I told him about the time I was in four-point restraint and vomited straight up. And uh, that got a reaction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so finally I said, look, I'm not asking you to recommend me. He said, recommend you? Recommend you? I wouldn't offer your name for consideration. No attorney in the history of this nation has ever had happened to him things that have happened to you or done the things you've done. I suggest you forget the law. Go into the countryside. Try to regain your health and simple labor. <laughs> when members of this law firm walk into a courtroom, they represent strength and determination steadfastness in the face of adversity. Send you? Boy, I'll tell you, I was crushed. I wasn't ready for that. If I could have slithered across the floor like a serpent under the door to the nearest bar to drown the shame of that, that bottomless bottle like I always had, I'd have done it. But I thought if I do, he'll be right. I can't take it, and I won't give him the satisfaction. I went out and drank coffee at him. <laughs> About ten years later, that guy flipped out. Took a check protector and a secretary, ran to Europe, disgraced his law firm, the legal profession, his family, the city of Pasadena. One of the worst pyrotechnic displays of misconduct I've ever seen, and he did it cold sober. Whereas about eight or nine years ago, the governor of our state called me and told me he was appointing me to the appellate bench. As far as I know, the highest judicial office ever held by a sober alcoholic in the state of California. You know what happens now? If I enter a courtroom, the members of that law firm are there. They stand up and they remain standing until I tell them they can be seated. <laughs> All power to the powerless. <laughs> and yet I haven't really changed all that much. I don't drink, it's as great as change to come into the life of now all of course. Learn to laugh at myself. Which, by the way, if you don't learn to do, you're going to miss the greatest joke in your own generation. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I sometimes sit on our Supreme Court. Seven of us in our black robes. Six deadly serious outside and apparently inwardly. One serious on the outside and inwardly. God damn, will you look at this? <laughs> <laughs> And it even comes out in my writings. See, now that I know I don't know anything, whenever I publish a decision, it becomes binding law on 26 million people. <laughs> and my AA stuff works in there. You know, because after a time, when I mentioned earlier, we have liturgical ways of speaking. We identify each other. You meet some, another AA in the store. You don't know he's an AA, but, you know, you, you'll go ahead, you know, easy does it. Hello, oh, first thing you know. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> And I, I find this comes out in my writings, even. You know, we use ancient expressions like, uh, we'll say his complaint sounds in tort, or it sounds in contract. I don't know why. I suppose Blackstone said it a couple centuries ago, and somebody thought, that's a grabber. And we've been doing it ever since. Uh, I, I had a decision once which I said, no point would be served by setting out a fellow's complaint in detail. Suffice it to say, it sounds in self-pity and resentment, but saying that states no cause of action known to the law. Uh, uh, I used to brag about being a good father. I, about every Sunday, I took my children out for a drunk drive, and <laughs> uh, I wrote a decision that began that way. I fell it one morning while out for a drunk drive, and I uh, got a call from the newspaper. Uh, I even had one not too long back where I said, in law, as in life, half measures avail us nothing. Uh, and uh, my colleagues say, where do you get those lines? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but this is what AA is about. It is about living. Not about death, it's about living. For the first time, if you are an alcoholic, you're going to be free. Up until now, you've been a slave. Booze told you what to do. Now you're going to be free. Do anything you want. Wild, exciting out there. 
you find this universe and the world dull, it's because you're a dull son of a bitch. Because it's, <laughs> it's one exciting universe. As I say, I raced motorcycles that I couldn't have done because I was too dignified and afraid you'd think my drinking had to do with it. Took my first free fall parachute jump just before I became a grandfather. Ran marathon, went scuba diving. I know you're supposed to study, put on flippers, you know, and learn that I am, have, I hum a couple of bars, you know. The way. Besides, they told me everything you need to know is in the big book anyhow. And, uh, I, I put that crap in, jumped off that Catalina Island, so beautiful down there, and ran out of air 50 feet down, you know. I, I put my higher power to the test, I'll tell you. <laughs> you can do anything you want on this program, anything. It's like some god set forth a piece of experience and said, take what you want and then pay for it. <laughs> you're sober, you're going to find out what it costs. But it's wonderful, it's exciting, it's thrilling. Free at last, free at last, great God Almighty to be free at last. And that's what this world is about. We're not here that long. Even you young people, 50 years, we're all going to be dead. A wink of a flesh to lie, we're gone. The bird of time has but a little way to flutter, and the bird is on the wing, the poet says. This is what it's about. Get out there and live. Miracles will happen. They're building a new state building now, right in the middle of Skid Row, part of the Los Angeles Redevelopment Project. It's supposed to be completed next year. If I'm still in office, I'll be able to throw a wine bottle out my chamber's window and hit where I sold blood. If I can get some loft on the bottle, I'll be able to hit Clancy down at the Midnight Mission. <laughs> if such a prospect isn't enough to keep you sober, I really don't know what it would take. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.